One of the things that I did want to talk about too with venomous spiders is make sure <coughs> that some spiders or um, species of um, spiders and you know just the germs that are flying around can um, become infected with the tetanus spores. So I don't know if your agency requires you guys to have tetanus shots um, at a minimum of every 10 years or not. Um, but just remember, kind of keep your, your tetanus shots up to date as well. So what I have heard, and I know that this was a question that I had with um, Jeff when we started putting this program together, um, especially when we get to the, I think I might skip to dog bites first and then come back to snakes. Um, so go advance two slides, uh, another slide. Oh, no, that's it right there. Um, one of the questions that I had to Jeff was, were rabies vaccin vaccinations pre-exposure being offered? And I know there are some agencies that provided. I wasn't sure about you, so it sounds like Cumberland's doing it. Is anybody else um, doing that? Norfolk said they were doing it too. Is anybody else online doing it? I know it was on the health assessment, but I wasn't sure if they okay. were actually I think that's a that's an important piece of information for from a workers comp perspective to know, um, especially with the treatment that they just talked about. You know, two shots versus several shots, um, or you know, for a series of four shots, two two days apart versus you know, m multiple shots over a longer period of time. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about dog bites um, because. We had quite a few, um, and I know that this is sort of a hot topic for you guys, or some of you out there. How are we preventing dog bites now? Or do you have any questions about dog bites? How to prevent them? Because there are some strategies and techniques that can be used, and um, I know that we're getting bit quite a bit. So what, any questions out there? Any thoughts on it? All right, well, let me give you what I would consider to be best practices related to um, if you have an aggressive dog that's charging you or you have um, a dog that you're not familiar with. And I know that there's a push or a movement out there that people want to use mace or pepper spray. And I think the thing that we need to stop and take a look at is if we as an agency make that available, or we as an agency issue that to employees, then we have to train people on that particular um, defensive product. And with that training comes actual exposure to the, to the product, which means, just like a law enforcement officer, that you have to be exposed to the material you're going to be um, spraying because there's going to be mist that comes back at you as you're spraying the animal or whatever or the individual whoever um, and what that means is we're going to have to we're going we as employees may have an exposure there may be people who are allergic to it and don't know it until they actually get exposed to it um, the, and I don't necessarily recommend mace um, or pepper spray for that reason. Um, even if you choose to use it, the agency doesn't issue it, I think you need to, to think about some things as far as once it's discharged out of the canister, depending on the wind, depending on a bunch of different factors, you will have some burning of your skin and eyes and mucous membranes which means you're going to water, your nose is going to run, you're going to cough, it's going to burn. And then we have to say, okay, we've sprayed it, but we still have to do the work that we were there to do, um, which means you may need to have to carry extra water bottles to wash your face, wash your arms, your hands, where you're exposed to it. So you're going to have not only the exposure to yourself that you're going to have to try to wash off the best that you can. Um, you've got the animal or individual that you've sprayed and then, um, you know, you still have to do your work. So what my recommendation or what, what is typical 
um, non-hazardous to human type um, sprays is just using, if you go to the grocery store, um, there are, you know, like lemon juice or lime juice in the canisters that look like a lemon or lime, and if you squeeze it, it's got a pretty strong projectile. Um, it's acidic, so it's going to burn the dog's eyes. Um, it may burn, it may not taste good, so it may alleviate their aggressiveness. Um, there are some other products for purchase out there that are not supposed to be harmless or harmful to humans. I personally have not tried those. Um, I've done some research on them, um, and I don't know how effective they really are in preventing an aggressive dog from stopping. Um, the other thing you can do that um, if you have a dog that's charging at you is use the things that you have, an umbrella, and open up the umbrella so that you have the umbrella as a barrier between you and the animal um, until you can get to a safe place back into your vehicle um, or on the, another side of the fence. So those are things that I would recommend. Um, I would probably would not recommend the route of mace or um, pepper spray only because that can create a whole nother layer of issues that you have to think about from a worker safety perspective standpoint. So um, any questions about that? Anybody use any other products that, um, have, that are or have been effective? Well, let's talk a little bit about snakes. Um, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, there are roughly three snakes that are venomous. Um, you have the cottonmouth or, or water moccasin that are located in the Tidewater region of Virginia. There's a couple colonies here locally in Chesterfield. Um, there's in the, on the Appomattox River. Um, so that's where you're going to find most of your uh, water moccasins, cottonmouths. The second um, or the largest venomous snakes in the Commonwealth of Virginia are copperheads. Um, the difference between a copperhead and a water moccasin um, is difficult to tell when they're in their juvenile state. They look the same. They're going to be kind of a brownish color, and they're going to have like an hourglass band on them. Um, I think if you look at one of the handouts from the CDC, it has pictures of those snakes. If you go out to... Um, the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, they have a great, um, some great pictures, and they also have a snake book out there that talks about um, the various snakes in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and then, of course, the three venomous ones. Um, so more than likely, um, most of us, if we're going to come in contact with a venomous snake, it's going to probably be a copperhead. Um, the third snake is the rattles, timber rattlesnake located um, like starting in Danville area and then southwest Virginia. Um, usually with rattlesnakes, you'll hear the snake before you actually see it. Um, the most aggressive snake of all three is the, co is the cottonmouth or water moccasin. Um, and like I said, when the cottonmouth and the water moccasin are in their juvenile forms, they're very um, difficult to tell apart. Um, the water moccasin is probably the most aggressive, and it will actually charge at you. Um, it usually sits up, opens its mouth, and says, hello, here I am. Um, so the things that, those are the, now, there's a variety of other snakes. The way you can tell the difference between a venomous snake and a non-venomous snake um, is going to be the shape of their head. A venomous snake is going to look more like a spade or a triangle. Um, it's going to have like fatter cheeks, so to speak. Um, and then the, if you want to get close enough to the snake, which I don't, um, you can look at its eyes. Um, a venomous snake will have a slit for an eye, basically. The pupil will be up and down where um, a non-venomous snake will be round like a regular pupil. So that's how you can tell. Um, personally, my recommendation is if you see a snake, go the other way. Um, for those of you that have to walk through high grass, walk in fields, um, my suggestion 
is um, use a walking stick of some sort or pick up a stick on your way in, um, especially if the grass is taller, and just use the stick in front of you to kind of move the grass around. So if a snake is going to strike, it's going to strike the stick first, or maybe it'll scurry out of the way. Um, that's also why I recommend um, leather work boots, um, at least if a snake is going to strike at you if you don't see it, um, it, it may get caught in the leather of your work boot versus your ankle if you're just wearing sneakers. Um, that's just a best practice recommendation. Um, your agency should be doing something called hazard assessments where they've evaluated your work task and determined what type of personal protective equipment or clothing is needed for that. It's on your safety page. It's on your safety page? Okay. Um, the one thing that we need, to, um, unless you're really going out and you're looking for snakes and that's part of your job, which I don't think, I don't think it's anybody's here, um, they do make uh, snake gaiters or snake chaps that go up to your knees to help prevent, you know, if a snake does strike, it goes in, but, you know, it's, it's not going to puncture your skin. If, if you're in a highly infested area and you know that that's um, something that you may need, then maybe something you have to discuss. Um, you know, the other thing is if you're having to be on your hands, you know, working, doing something on the ground level, um, wear glo leather gloves, that'll kind of help too. If you have to reach down into stuff that you're not sure, you can't see real well into, at least if a snake strikes, it's, um, you know, it's going to per it's gonna help to um, maybe not hurt as bad. Non-venomous snakes bite just as much as venomous snakes are, and um, a non-venomous snake bite um, I think, I don't know if I have a picture in the attachment or not. Um, a venomous snake is two prongs. A non-venomous snake will have multiple, uh, multiple um, puncture wounds on your hand in a shape of a V. So there's all kinds of information out there. You can go out to, I think it's Herbatology of Virginia, and they've got a ton of information about snakes. The big thing I want to make sure that everybody knows is if you are bitten, you're not sure, you know, what bit you because, you know, you feel the strike and they're gone, um, call 911, you know, call for emergency services right away. Um, and remember, if we're working alone or we're out there where there's no cell phone reception, what are we going to do? Okay. Um, you need to seek medical attention. R try to stay as calm as possible because what you don't want to do, especially if it's a venomous snake bite, is you don't want that venom pumping through your system faster. So try to stay as calm as you can because um, it can kind of slow down the spread of the venom. Make sure that, um, you know, you wash the bite with soap and water and clean it the best that you can. Um, what you don't want to do is try to trap the snake. Um, back in the olden days, we were told, you know, cut the snake bite and then, you know, use your mouth and suck out the venom. Well, we don't do that anymore. So way back when, that's what we were taught. We don't do that anymore. Um, you know, don't apply a tourniquet. People think you should apply a tourniquet above a snake bite. Don't do that because you can actually do more damage to the body part than the snake venom itself can. Um, don't apply ice or immerse in water. That can cause problems. You want to want to wash the wound, but you don't want to pack it with ice. Sometimes that speeds up the venom depending on um, what type of um, snake it is. And I'm not a herb, I'm not a by any okay. means snake expert. And then try not to drink and consume ca caffeinated beverages. Don't apply ice. Um, wash the wound. Um, and if you go out, um, there's all kinds of stuff. But the herpetology page um, out there, I think it's Virginia Herpetologist, they have some great information, um, great pictures um, to help you determine, you know, what kind of snake you might have seen um, and first aid treatments and that type of stuff. Um, any questions about snakes? Let's talk a little bit about other wildlife that we see here in Virginia. Um, Anybody ever run across a bear? Wild pack dogs, feral cats, 
mountain cougars. There's a bunch out there in, uh, well, I shouldn't say a bunch. There are some out in southwest Virginia. Coyotes, foxes, all those animals are out there. So you need to be aware, groundhogs, raccoons, possums, all those, you know, all those types of animals. Remember, the best thing to do is if you, we're, we're not going to stop the wildlife, but if you come in contact with it, what are you going to do? What's your escape plan? So think about that. There's also a, um, some information about living with black bears in Virginia. Um, that's from the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. Um, we're seeing more and more black bears coming um, into more urban settings. I know here locally there's that one. I don't know if they ever caught that one in Henrico that's been hanging around in that neighborhood. Um, but I do know that not too long ago, um, out on 460, I'm not sure when it was, but um, a black bear ran out in front of a tractor trailer and um, was killed. And it was a 450 pound black bear. So um, they're out there um, because we as humans are encroaching on their space. Um, they're starting, you're starting to see them more prevalently. I know that um, the coyote population is growing. I know that um, Foxes, both red and brown fox, are coming um, out, and you see them more. And, um, you know, the best thing to do is if you are, you know, are encounter or you can encounter wildlife is to slowly back away from it. Don't run from it. Sometimes that's the misconception. You just slowly back away from it and get yourself to... Um, you know, a, a safe place and try not to get cornered. I know that some of you, you have to go trap animals and your taught techniques and um, procedures on how to do that. Any other wildlife that we've talked about or haven't talked about that you've encountered and had issues with or know somebody's had an issue with? Let's talk a little bit about poisonous plants. Um, poisonous ivy leaves of three let it be um, there's a sample sheet that I uh, provided a couple of them one from the NIOSH and one from um, the Centers for Disease Control um, pretty much all this information a lot of the information um, even the doctors talked about you can find out on CDC which is a great resource um, they have great information out there to help and assist you with this information um, one of the things that I want to talk about from a workers' comp perspective and an injury accident prevention perspective is even if, if you see this, this picture on the right of this tree, on this tree, if you look at it, are poison ivy vines, and they look kind of hairy. Okay, so it looks like a dead vine, but it's got hair on it. Um, even though it looks dead, you can still, if you are sensitive to the oils in that vine, you can still contact poison ivy or get the blisters from it. So the important thing is to remember that even though today you are not prone to getting the blisters from poison ivy and you've been exposed to it thousands of times or hundreds of times, it doesn't necessarily mean that the next time you touch it or come in contact with it that you won't get poison ivy. Um, so the best thing to do is use barrier creams. If you know you're going to be out and about around those things, use those long sleeves again, long pants. That's why I don't encourage shorts by any means um, for the ticks and the bugs and then the poison ivies. Um, if you do come in contact with it, and you are sensitive to it, wash that area the best that you can. And the best thing is make sure you're not scratching and then transmitting it. Um, and I have to say this because we, I've seen it happen. Um, make sure if you're out and about and you've been out in the woods, you've touched things, you haven't had gloves on, especially for men, Make sure you wash your hands really, really good. Even if you're wearing gloves and you take your gloves off, make sure you wash your hands really, really good before you use the restroom. Um, there are known cases of people contacting poison ivy um, or, you know, 
poison oak or come in contact with it and um, they had gloves on and then they didn't use good hygiene practices and then ended up getting it in um, personal places. So please keep that um, as a reminder in the back of your head as well. Um, there's also something out there called um, a stinging nettle. I don't know if you've ever seen those. They got these long barbs on it. Um, it's a weed, it's coarse, it's got like stringy hair and it's got like thorns on it and they can actually stick in you and uh, lodge into your skin. They got kind of burrs on them um, and they can cause you a lot of pain too. Um, so think about that. The big thing um, that I want to talk about related to any of the poisonous oak or poison ivy is um, be careful about burning it, whether it's your personal life or for your work environment. Um, because if somebody is sensitive to it and they breathe the smoke in from that burning plant, the smoke can contain oils and you can get it in your lungs and then it becomes a big problem.